<clears throat> Thank you very much, Irene. And uh, before I go into this uh, today, I just want to explain I've been lying on my sickbed for the last two days with flu. It's not COVID, so I don't have the big C, but um, please forgive me if I have to periodically sit down and just have a rest or a big drink of water, because I'm absolutely exhausted at the moment. Um, I also want to acknowledge those trolls and debunkers out there, and apparently there's a guy out the front, there's a guy out the front from the Australian Skeptics with a sign, and uh, um, apparently he's saying Ross Coulthard's going to get the Australian Skeptics Bent Fork Award, apparently that's the uh, alleged derisory award that they give to somebody who the Skeptics don't think is being scientific. And it's funny because I would accuse him in his uh, placard of being unscientific because he makes a number of assertions that are actually demonstrably false and he should really do his homework. Uh, he, for example, asserts that I am asserting that I believe in interdimensional beings. I don't necessarily. Um, he asserts that I believe in life after death. I don't necessarily. What I do, though, say, what I do believe is that we should start seriously engaging and looking at the evidence. And that's the next thing this guy apparently says on his placard. He says, we want real evidence, empirical data. Couldn't agree more. And this is the problem. He's sitting outside with his silly little placard, thinking that I'm intimidated by his threat of a bent fork award. I'd love a bent fork award, bring it on. Uh, I mean, the simple fact is we live in an era, and I've been, I was agonising while I was thinking before about what the hell I'm going to talk about today, and I was thinking about how I'm being led very much to the idea of the incompatibility or the misunderstanding, the, um, the uh, huge diversion between pure science and what I do, which is investigative journalism. And I, I want to discuss that for a while, but before I do, I, I want to pay tribute to people who've come from a very, very long way. There's some people who've come all the way from Seattle. Seattle, USA. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Now, I, I appreciate you have an interest in UAPs, sir, but you're flank, frank, frankly, you're a mad yank, seriously. <laughs> I mean that in the nicest possible way. Um, welcome, and it's lovely to have you here, and uh, thank you also to all of you who've come from far afield. I'm, I, I'm actually humbled and a little overwhelmed at the idea that there are so many people who want to come and listen to me on a Saturday afternoon. It's a beautiful day outside, guys. Um, you know, there's an All Blacks game tomorrow where the All Blacks are going to thump the South Africans, and seriously, you've really got to get your priorities right. So let's get to the subject of UAPs. Let me tell you that um, probably five or six years ago when I first called my now good friend James Rigney and asked him about this amazing Wilson document, I was a very, very, very intransigent debunker sceptic. I was acculturated as a journalist to the idea that um, UAPs, UFOs, flying saucers, little green men, it's all bullshit. And the interesting thing is, you people in the room here are very much a rare exception to, a, I think, a societal trend that still treats the whole subject of UAPs with a kind of a default derision, a default scepticism and ridicule. And I did that until five or six years ago, just like that silly little bloke with a silly little sign outside the front. And the interesting thing is, most people, I believe, who take that position, including most of my colleagues in the mainstream media, and a large part of the scientific community, they haven't actually taken the time to do the research. They say they have, but they haven't. I had a bolshy letter, by the way, from Dick Smith this week, the uh, former president, or might be still the president of Skeptics Australia, and he was talking about the Westall case. And um, the Westall case, for those of you who aren't aware, it was 6th April 1966. A group of enormous number of school kids on a school uh, quadrangle uh, playground uh, in the middle of the day, around about 10 o'clock in the morning, 
looked up during their playtime and in the company of multiple teachers, adults, and people also in surrounding houses, saw, depending on who you talk to, either one or three hovering discs, metallic discs, apparent craft. And it remains still one of Australia's most renowned and most investigated UAP sightings, still officially unexplained. Um, a few people have tried to suggest it was a highball balloon, a balloon that was being deployed by the Americans from Sail Air Force Base, uh, quite a way northeast of Melbourne. But uh, I'm, I'm not convinced, and neither are the people who are the witnesses, who all very strongly assert, even though there are contradictions in their evidence, which Dick was picking me up on, he made a huge play of the fact that Andrew Greenwood, the um, science teacher, who was one of the people I interviewed in my documentary, had it said that he only saw one object, whereas most of the people there asserted that they saw multiple. And frankly, I, I don't think that's fatal to the issue. Just because somebody says they saw one object and not three, when you have literally hundreds of people saying they saw this object. It's, it's, not a, it's not a cultural state of people confusing themselves or all becoming obsessed by the same delusion. This is a consistent record of witness sightings and this is what I'm coming to. I really want to drill down into the, the dichotomy, the chasm that exists between pure science and what I think a lot of us are all interested in, which is witness observation. Science, I think, is being disingenuous when it asserts it knows the truth. I really do. And it's something I write about in my book. I think that fundamentally, um, most scientists, when you actually talk to them about the scientific method, they have no fucking idea what they're talking about. They really don't. They're not consistent in what they mean. Um, I respect science. I have a huge respect for science. I think science is an absolutely fundamental way to begin to understand this mystery, this phenomenon that we're trying to describe. And as much as possible, I think we need to rely on data, empirical data that we can gather and to try and make an assessment. I think that's fundamentally important and I agree that is a truth. But there is a simple reality with the phenomenon of UAPs, and I say a phenomenon because I don't know what it is. I don't know if it is interdimensional. I've quoted people who've asserted to me that they believe that it is, which is what the chap from the UFO skeptics, um, the Australian skeptics, is asserting. It doesn't mean I necessarily believe it. I've talked to people who've said that they think that it might be a manifestation of some uber consciousness doesn't mean that I necessarily believe it. What I am is a journalist. I report back what people tell me. I report back observation. I report back what witnesses say. And this is where I, I, I really want to drill down into what I think is being is disingenuous about establishment science. Scientists say, fundamentally, Witness evidence is no evidence. They're very, very dismissive of any of you who say, or say, for example, the Westall witnesses, they're very, very dismissive of witness evidence. In journalism, when you have multiple consistent corroborative evidence with witnesses, you can rely on that. And the reason why? Because our legal system relies on that. It's an absolutely fundamental part of our legal system that consistent witness evidence is evidence. And I'm not going to hear an argument from scientists that people who say they've seen a phenomena should just be dismissed because it hasn't been empirically measured, measured by a radar, a video, or some sensor system that corroborates what they say. Let's talk about the Westall incident. In the Westall case, my friend Shane Ryan has described, I think last time I spoke to him, it was over 130 to 150 individual witnesses who saw with their own eyes what they saw that day over Westall in 1966. Yes, there are inconsistencies, and we acknowledge those inconsistencies. 
And yes, I think there are fabricators. I think there are people who've leapt onto the story and they're pretty easily picked out. People who assert that they saw things that frankly I don't believe they did. But ultimately, when I sat with James, the, one of the first weekends that I actually met James Rigney, I flew down to Melbourne and I felt a compulsion to go down and sit down with him and talk about the Wilson documents. And I, very kindly, James actually agreed to introduce me to some of the Westall witnesses. And so we went to the school quadrangle where this incident occurred. And people drove from all over Victoria I found that quite amazing. These people, like this is decades later, they were so driven by the experience that they'd had in 1966 and so gratified that somebody like me wanted to engage with them and wanted to talk to them about the phenomenon that they'd witnessed. They came, they drove hundreds of miles just to come and talk to me, to share what they'd seen. They weren't asking for reward, they weren't asking for fame. They were actually uncomfortable, most of them, with the idea that they had to be interviewed for television. I actually had to persuade them to talk. They weren't fame seekers. These weren't people seeking some kind of notoriety because of this experience. It struck me, and I had this slow realisation as a journalist, these people had seen something real, and I couldn't dismiss it. And this is the thing that I think is the most disingenuous part of science. I'm not dismissing science. I think we should, gosh, if we'd had radars there that day, I would have loved to have had a radar there that day. I would have loved to have had a high-speed camera, an infrared camera. I would have loved to have had every possible digital camera known to human science on that quadrangle that day. But the problem with science is that it expects, as part of the scientific method, for whatever it is that they're hypothesizing to be replicable, to be repeatable. And it's part of good science that an experiment can be repeated and tested and then proven. The problem with the phenomenon is it doesn't manifest itself on call. It's playing games with us. Now, I don't know whether that's an intelligence or whether it's a natural phenomenon. I have a suspect that it, I have a suspicion that it's an intelligence. I have a suspicion that there is something there that is intelligent. And the reason why I think that is because I've been very privileged. And I know it frustrates people that I can't always talk about my sources. And this is the other issue that is the misunderstanding between science and journalism. Journalists rely on uh, off-the-record background sources. We have to. It's a fundamental requirement of our profession. Because frankly, if you're a scientist, a government official, a military person or an intelligence officer that is essentially duty-bound by your security oath or by non-disclosure agreements or by secrecy agreements not to disclose what you do, speaking to me fundamentally at the heart of it is a crime. And I've been confronted, I can remember once I did a website called Leak a Secret on an old program I worked for called the Sunday Program at Channel 9. And I was rung by Defence Intelligence, the Australian Defence Department's intelligence office, and they were really worried that I was soliciting secrets. And I said, you guys don't own secrets. I said, a secret's just a, an intimate exchange of information. It doesn't necessarily have to be a defence secret. But they were so angry about it that I thought we'd better put a correction up and I, I put a little asterisk on the site and basically said, by the way, if you think that we are soliciting secret defence secrets, we're not, just to put them at their rest. But the, the interesting thing was I wouldn't have been at all unhappy if somebody had leaked me defence secrets and, and people were. And the interesting thing was that was back in uh, 2008 when I first... No, actually, it was before then, actually. No, God, no. I'm getting, I'm getting old. It was 1995 when I first started doing that. I started soliciting secrets. And very early on, when the first vestiges of the internet started manifesting themselves, much to my irritation, there were these annoying people who kept on telling me that I needed to investigate UFOs. And I'd just laugh. I'd just put it to one side and go, fucking crazy people, you know. And as the years went on, 
Um, I, I'd had a, uh, I used to work for a show called Four Corners on the ABC, which is like the ABC uh, public broadcaster's premier public affairs program. And I was doing a story that related to the Air Force, and there were some very, very senior Air Force officials who were escorting us around the country for a completely unrelated story, nothing to do with UFOs. But we were sitting in the mess, I think it was Richmond Air Force Base in northwestern Sydney, and uh, we'd had a couple of beers, we were relaxing at the end of a very long day's filming. And I remember, this would have been 1993, 1994, and I remember the, um, so that's 30 years ago. And I remember this very senior officer in the Air Force leaned across and he said, can I ask you, why don't you chaps do stories about UFOs? That's how Air Force people speak, by the way. They're not in the least bit English, but, you know, they do. They go, why don't you chaps talk about UFOs? And I, I said, but they're bullshit. No, they're not. And I said, what? And he leaned across the table and he said, I I've seen them. You know, he's seen them. He's pointing to another chap. And, and then in the course of the evening, as the beers went on, he'd call over, because this was the main mess at Richmond Air Force Base, and he's calling over pilots that he knows. And he's going, yeah, tell, tell this chap, tell this reporter, you know, what you saw. And he goes, you sure, boss? And, and he goes, yeah, yeah, tell him. It's off the record, isn't it? And I went, uh, yeah, 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 sure. And so in the, in, the, in the course of an evening, I'm sitting there, and it kind of rocked my worldview, because here's a very senior official in our Air Force, saying to me, this is real. And I'm a journalist who, frankly, any time I floated the story of doing UFOs in a newsroom, in newspapers or television, invariably you would get a little tinfoil hat left on your desk, you know, or, or somebody would take the piss. There is such a cultural antipathy to the whole idea of engaging with the subject of UAPs. And I accepted that for the large part of my career. I'm in my early 60s. And probably for 40 years as a journalist, I've basically put up with the idea that UFOs are rubbish. And frankly, all of you are completely nuts. So thanks very much, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that conversation, the soliciting secrets button that I installed on the Sunday program website one of the most consistent things that I got people sending me information about were UFOs. And it fascinated me because I remember, and this is very, very early on in the internet, I mean, seriously guys, for some of you in the audience, the internet's a very new thing. And 30 years ago, it really wasn't much at all, frankly. And I mean, I can remember we did a story on um, porn on the Sunday program and how dangerous it was about online porn. And I had to get permission from Channel 9 IT to download porn. <laughs> and it was six megabyte. And it was such a huge file, six megabyte, do you remember? And then the head of IT came down and supervised while we downloaded this porn. <laughs> and it was, it was one smutty photograph and then I was doing this kind of pompous piece to camera as a reporter going, and look at this outrage, you know, this terrible, you know, this is, this is the new reality. But what, what really interested me was I started realising that the internet was a liberating way of soliciting information from the general public that, frankly, journalism had never seen before. And what blew me away, I remember I went away one summer and I'd created this leak a secret button and I went away for the summer, and then I came back, and I thought, what stories am I going to do this year? And I opened the inbox, and there were thousands of messages. And I realised that people sitting at home felt secure about engaging with me as a journalist and sending in their stories and their accounts of what they wanted investigated. And in between the political corruption and you know, everything else that you get as a journalist, what blew me away was probably by far one of the most dominant subjects was this bloody UFO story again. And I, I, I then spent another probably 10 years trying to ignore it. And I uh, left the Sunday program, went to Channel 7, worked at Sunday night. 
and I went to 60 minutes. And it was around about then, in about 2014, 2015, and I was beginning to take an interest because of the internet. I was reading about the whole UFO subject. All of a sudden, there was all of this information that was suddenly available. And the problem for me as a journalist was you try and figure out what's rubbish and what's not. And, you know, I was reading about secret space program and stuff like that and thinking, well, that's crazy shit. And then, and then I'd, I'd read about Westall and I'd go, wow, that, that's interesting. And then I read books by Bill Chalker, who I'm pleased to say is probably the top Australian researcher into UAPs is joining us here today. I read books by Bill Chalker. I, I read articles by people like Keith Basterfield. And I realised there is a string running through all of this madness of people who are actually taking this really seriously. And the dilemma in understanding this subject is figuring out the wheat from the chaff, figuring out who the crazy people are, and I mean no disrespect, I'm not really saying you're all crazy, but there are some people who are fabricators, and I think we know who they are, and they've caused an enormous amount of damage to the, the issue of serious investigation of the phenomenon. And some of them, frankly, and they know who they are, are deliberate agents of disinformation. I'm quite confident of it. They're people who essentially are, I believe, witting tools of various intelligence agencies that we now know since, well, basically since the Robertson panel in the early 1950s. It's there, and that, that was a turning point for me when Bill Clinton organised the declassification of files under the FOI Act and essentially created a, a mandate that there must be a very good reason for a file to be kept secret beyond either 20 or 30 years. And then all of a sudden, all this UFO stuff came onto the market online that wasn't wacky ufologists' speculation on some blog. This was the CIA library. This was the Defence Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency. Um, these were government agencies in the US, and among those documents was, I think, very early documents from the CIA and other intelligence agencies which set out a deliberate policy of disinformation to disinform the public, to make them take less of an interest in the UAP issue. Now, officially, from the safe gatekeeper side of the defence and intelligence community, the reason they did this is because during the Cold War, they were worried that if the public kept on reporting UFOs, flying saucers, UAPs, whatever you want to call them, it would clog up the reporting system and mean that real sightings of real objects wouldn't be... Does that sound as much bullshit as it does to you as it does to me? It doesn't make any sense when you think about it. But that's the official excuse. The official excuse is that they were worried that if people reported UFOs, which of course aren't real, then the real stuff, which I, I mean presumably they're meaning missiles from Russia, um, wouldn't get reported. I mean, it's an, it's an illogical argument. It makes no sense. But that's been the main argument for why there was, and I think continues to be, a deliberate policy of disinformation, ridicule, stigma and taboo attached to this subject for much of the last 70 or 80 years. And that was a turning point for me, is that the reason why this subject has now become very much a big issue for all of us, and I think millions of people around the world. I think one of the reasons I'm so exhausted at the moment is because I'm so run down. I get literally thousands of emails every day from all over the world. I, I, my, my wife just tells me to shut my computer down and come and have a life because I groan every morning I log on because I really enjoy getting this contact. I've never, as a journalist before, had this level of engagement with a, stub with a story. It is utterly phenomenal. And it's why I don't care about silly little men outside with their silly little signs. 
It's why I don't care if Dick Smith writes me a stroppy letter complaining that Andrew Greenwood only saw one flying saucer and not three. It's, it's so fucking petty. It's so unscientific. Because what it reflects is an unwillingness to engage with a real phenomenon that we all frankly know is real. The issue is, what is it? And the only way we're ever going to find that out is by engaging. So I would have welcomed that gentleman with the placard in to sit down and listen and hear the evidence. And if he did what I did and sat down and read pretty much as much as I could of the CIA's UFO archive, it changed my the world view. It made me realise that, yes, in public, in the media, we were all being told that this story is absolute bollocks, it's rubbish. Whereas privately, and this is shown in black and white in these documents, there was a decision made by senior military officials to lie, to mislead. Now, I'm a journo. I just love a bloody good story when I see one. This is a rip snorter of a yarn. I cannot believe, I mean, to me, this is the biggest story in human history. Because as Senator Marco Rubio said, and I noticed my friend Marek von Rennenkampf in an article I commend to you this morning in The Hill, he wrote a great piece where he, he quoted um, Marco Rubio, and Marco Rubio basically said, look, either there are a whole lot of people in very high positions former serving intelligence defence people, scientists, government officials who've gone complete raving bonkers, or there's something there that is worthy of investigation. And frankly, it's, it's an argumentum ad hominem attack to suggest that what I'm doing is declaring what it is. I'm not. I just don't know. But what I can tell you is that there is a reality there that is worthy of investigation. And yes, by golly, I'm with you, my friends, the scientists. I agree. We do need to dedicate science towards it. Science is the way that we understand the world. And yes, science has failed, completely failed to engage with this subject for the last 70 to 80 years because it's been hoodwinked. Like I was hoodwinked in the media. The media has been misled. And it's not that some little man in black is coming into the office of the editor and saying, don't let that cool tart guy do that story. What they're doing is much more clever. They're attaching a stigma and a, a ridicule and a taboo to this subject, which I don't think is warranted. And so there was a huge turning point, a realization for me as a journalist that frankly, we in the mainstream media have been completely failing to do our job. We're meant to hold power to account. We're meant to question and ask questions. And the thing that really shocked me as a journo, for example, let's, let's take the Admiral Wilson document. And for those of you who don't know, there was, a, there was a, a document that leaked from the estate of astronaut Edgar Mitchell, who was the Apollo 14 lunar module pilot, one of the greatest astronauts, an absolute giant of a human being, a brain the size of a planet, and a man who, when he came back from the moon, acknowledged that he'd had what's called the overview experience. He'd had that incredible sensation of realising how small he was in the universe and the inevitability of there being other forms of intelligent life. And he devoted the rest of his life to that inquiry, created the um, Institute for Noetic Science. And in the course of his work, he became part of the board of directors of um, Bob Bigelow's National Institute of Discovery Science, NIDS. And in the course of being on that board, a chap called Dr. Eric Davis shared a paper with Dr. Hal Putoff, who was also on the NIDS board, which was a paper that described a meeting that he indubitably had with Admiral Thomas Wilson, the immediate past director of the Defense Intelligence Agency of the United States, the top position in defense intelligence in the United States. More importantly, Admiral Thomas Wilson, when he was a J2, the um, deputy director, DIA, the bloke who essentially did the briefings for intelligence for the Joint Chief of Staff for the American intelligence community, 
um, he had told Stephen Greer, who's a very controversial figure, but somebody who I think should be acknowledged for this work that he did, he told ufologist Stephen Greer in um, 2002 that he'd made inquiries into allegations that Greer had put to him and that he'd discovered that there was indeed a secrecy legacy program inside the Pentagon and in also inside private aerospace, which was concealing the existence of a, a legacy UAP, non-human intelligence technology, crash retrieval and reverse engineering program. And uh, in the course of a, a conversation that took place between Dr. Eric Davis and um, uh, uh, Admiral Tom Wilson some, uh, in, a, in a car park outside EG&G, the administrative um, uh, officials who ran the Area 51, the most extraordinary scenario, um, information was exchanged by Admiral Thomas Wilson to Dr. Eric Davis, which led up being put into these notes. These notes are extraordinary, because if true, they convey a reality which is truly momentous. It means that, if true, there has been a deceit on humanity for the last 80 years that the Americans reportedly recovered non-human technology in the 40s and since multiple non-human intelligence technology craft and that there has been a secret legacy program largely run within private aerospace in the de decades since where they've been attempting to back engineer this technology. Now, let's be honest about this. If you'd asked me five years ago whether this was true, I would have said this is crazy nonsense. And I'm sure the Australian skeptics, the gentleman with the placard out there and Dick Smith, I'm sure they would say it's crazy nonsense. But I am in absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the Admiral Wilson notes, the Eric Davis notes, the EWD notes, whatever you want to call them, they reflect a, a truth, they reflect a reality that has been concealed from the public. And the reason why I'm absolutely categorically sure is because of not only public statements made by certain individuals, who I won't embarrass by naming them here, I've had my own private conversations with my own sources as an investigative journalist, and I am beyond any shadow of a doubt absolutely certain that Admiral Thomas Wilson, even though he's denied it to me personally, Admiral Thomas Wilson did have a conversation with Dr. Eric Davis where he made these statements. Now, it could very well be that maybe Admiral Thomas Wilson was suffering a momentary delusion that day. Maybe, maybe what he revealed wasn't the truth. But you know what? It needs to be investigated. Because as, again, my good friend Marek von Brennenkamp said in the Hill article that was published this morning, there are now 10 former or serving military intelligence or government officials who've come forward, who've talked about the existence of retrieved non-human technology held in secret by s some part of the United States government or private aerospace. Now, it sounds like a crazy conspiracy theory, doesn't it? It really does. And I have still some trouble believing it. But I do think there's a very strong likelihood it's true. And the difficulty is for science, I can't name the sources. I can't say who these people are, who I'm talking to, who are telling me things. And if they demand to know, like... <laughs> Biggest mistake of my life, Rich Hoffman, who's a lovely man from SCU, the Scientific Coalition for the Study of UAPs. Rich Hoffman's one of the lead scientists on SCUAP, of which I'm a very proud member. And Rich took a completely legitimate swipe for a scientist at me today, basically saying that um, he thinks that um, it's unscientific of me to talk about things like a large... UFO craft, which was so large that it had to be built over rather than moving it. And he said that rather than making statements like that, we should all go to the scientific method 
and rely on the scientific method for proof of things before we make these assertions. Now, Rich is right, but not for the reasons that he says. He's right because, frankly, I now realise I should never have talked about that large craft because nobody was ever going to believe me. And you know what? I don't care. I don't care because I don't have to prove it to you. I know because I've spoken to multiple sources who've corroborated it to me, which is why I feel confident about talking about it. It's got so crazy in the last few months that I'll tell you I have had threats from people, death threats, people saying, if I don't reveal where this craft is, they're going to come and find me and kill me and attack me. That's how crazy some of these people are out there. And I can understand they're passionate. They want to know. And I've tried to explain this. The reason I can't talk about things like that is because as a journalist, one of the things I take very seriously is my obligation to make sure I don't recklessly put good people's lives at risk. I know this sounds old fashioned, but there are people who work in defense and intelligence who are doing a really good job to protect all of us from threats. And right now, the world has never been, I can tell you, a more dangerous place. I get up every morning and I start ringing sources in America and the UK and Australia, and a lot of them are in intelligence and defense, and it has never, ever been so bleak. I have never heard people talking about the inevitability of massive conflict, about the risk of the Middle East becoming a conflagration that goes far beyond the Middle East, of the risk of a third world war, of a thermonuclear exchange. And in that context, when I know the use that that particular object location is being used for, I know I'm doing the right thing by not talking about where it is. And for those people who threat and try and impose bullying on me to try and get me to reveal it, you don't understand the obligations that I'm under as a journalist. Not only am I keen to protect sources, I'm a patriot with my own country. And I do believe that it's important that we don't do things that can protect national security alliances. Like it or not, you know, we're in a very dangerous world right now, and UAPs, UFOs are just one of the issues that we have to confront. And um, a lot of the people that want UAP disclosure are also terribly worried about the risk of a conflagration and it's what obsesses them. And I think there's a real possibility right now that the escalation, the, um, the, the risk of this getting far worse in the Middle East is going to blow the UAP issue off the front page for a while and probably delay efforts in Congress to get things out into the open. And all I can ask is that people understand that there are good people in the intelligence community, the defence community, and particularly in the Congress. There are people that want this information out. And they're not being declaratory. You know, I've, I've actually had conversations with people where I've said, what is this? What are we talking about here? And it's very easy to talk about it just as a technology. It's, yes, I, I'm, I'm very certain in my own mind that we have, that when I say we, I mean the United States and other countries, humanity has recovered non-human technology. I'm pretty certain of that in my own mind. I can't be categorical because I haven't seen it. I haven't kicked the tyres of whatever it is. But the interesting thing is, on the source evidence that I've got, unless there are an enormous number of people who've just gone nuts or who, for their own reason, are disinforming me and a multitude of other people, I think that there is a reality there, but there are people wrestling with how to divulge that. And it's not an easy issue. I, I just want to explain a little bit why, because a lot of the people I'm talking to are scientists. And the thing that upsets them most of all is that good 
science, and this is the irony, by the way, for the little silly idiot outside with his silly placard, the good scientists that I'm talking to are frustrated that they know what they know and they are so constrained by compartmentalised TSSCI security clearances, they're not allowed to talk to the guy in the cubicle next door about what they're working on. In many cases, people I've spoken to have been asked to work on bits of technology without ever being told what that technology is, but they know full well it's not from here. Either that or it's some foreign adversary has done something miraculous. It's stuff that we've never seen before in the public domain on this planet. Now, contrary to the assertions of the debunkers and the trolls, I'm not saying I know for sure what it is, but by golly, don't we all want to know? And it needs to be investigated. And this is my problem. My problem is that there is this truculent resistance to the whole idea of even engaging with the subject. And that's my problem. I don't like that. When somebody tells me I can't do something, it really gets my back up. When they tell me that I'm not allowed to know something, that really annoys me. And one thing I'm very good at is finding shit out. <laughs> and I did find stuff out. And I'm, I, I tell you, and I don't want to sound melodramatic, but <laughs> there are things I know that I've been told about the phenomenon that I wish I didn't know. And it's sobering. And it's not all sweetness and light. I don't agree with Dr. Stephen Greer when he says that whatever this phenomenon is, it's benevolently intentioned. I, I, I don't. I'm sorry, I take a different view, and so do a large number of the people that I talk to. Um, I think humanity is going to find out relatively soon. Um, I think that what we're looking at is a... Um, I think we're hitting... It's funny, you know, I, I, I don't want to sound mystical, but I am shocked at how people are contacting me and saying they felt a compulsion to contact me. It's almost as if... And, and I know some idiot debunker is going to go, oh, Coulthard said, you know, people are being told to contact him. I don't know why, but there are an enormous number of people who are contacting me saying they felt a compulsion to get in touch with me, to give me information. And I am humbled by the trust that they've shown me. And one of the things that I, I, I lie in bed at night and worry about is knowing who some of these people are you know, some of these people are, are public figures and I'm humbled by the fact that they've taken me into their trust and urged me to continue to investigate this phenomenon. Because frankly, it's, it's not very good for my career to do this, by the way. Um, I, I've copped nothing but flack and criticism and ribald amusement from my colleagues in the uh, mainstream media for taking this subject seriously. But you know what? I'm looking forward to wiping their smug smiles off their faces. <laughs> um, how long do you want me to speak for, Irene, before we do questions? Yeah, sure, no problems. I just need to take a drink, otherwise I'm going to go hoarse. So, um, just drilling down again into the science thing, science versus journalism. We send people... I mean, I, I was a, a lawyer before I became a journalist, and one of the things that fascinated me was, in America, I got really interested in the idea that people were sent to their death on often very circumstantial evidence. And for a while, uh, through... In the south of the USA, I was um, linking up with um, attorneys in an organisation that was dedicated to providing legal advice to um, mainly black prisoners who'd been sentenced to death. And what really shocked me was the poor quality of the witness evidence in many of these cases. Often it was just one witness that sent this poor person in, onto death row. And they'd been sentenced to death. And 
as a journalist, I don't make an allegation or feel confident about asserting an allegation unless I have at least two or three impressively solid, in my view, corroborative witnesses. I can't always name those witnesses, but essentially, um, in order to support an allegation, behind the scenes, there's an enormous amount of information that you rely on to back up a, a story. And uh, it's funny, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you I'm um, doing a story with News Nation on Monday night uh, about an incident that took place over the Arctic Circle. And um, uh, it involves multiple corroborative witnesses and it involves a sighting of UAPs that took place well before the reported February shootdowns that the public haven't been told about. And multiple sources of mine have told me that this incident took place. And um, it's really interesting because um, for a month I've had questions in with the Pentagon uh, asking them to comment. And uh, finally we said to them, look, we are you know, literally close to broadcast, we need an answer. And so they buck passed us to NORAD, who came back with a, North, NORAD's the North American Aerospace Defence Command, which is a sort of an arm of Canadian and US collaborative defence for North America. And they came back with a statement and said that fighter jets were not scrambled to intercept these, any objects. And I'm reading what I wrote, and we didn't say that fighter grits were scrambled. It was another one of those slightly disingenuous responses that you get back from the Pentagon. So I'm wondering when we do the story, obviously what will happen is it's been neutralised by NORAD putting out a press release basically saying, OK, um, you may have this intelligence stuff telling you this stuff, but we're saying it's not true that jets were scrambled. And I'm going, I didn't say that. And this is often the way that they respond to the media. They use little nuggets of disinformation in their responses to respond to something that you never actually asked them about. And it's how they respond. You never get a straight answer. And this is my problem, is that if there's nothing to hide, if there really is nothing there, why is there this truculent resistance to scrutiny? You know, for example, David Grush, who um, I, I assume all of you may know, we, uh, I did an exclusive TV interview with um, a guy who was the former National Reconnaissance Office, former National Geospatial Intelligence Agency senior intelligence officer called David Grush. We interviewed him in May and it went to air in early June. And he made quite extraordinary allegations of there being a cover-up a long-standing Cold War-length cover-up of the fact of recovered technology, going right back, believe it or not, to 1930s Italy. And I just draw your attention to the fact the Pentagon has never, ever called David Grush a liar. The only thing they've said is that they've got, I think, Sean Kirkpatrick the head of ARO, the Pentagon's UAP investigation office, um, has been quoted as having told um, the Congress in response that he's seen no credible evidence of extraterrestrial visitation to this planet. Hang on a moment, that wasn't the question. The question should be, and I mean, I I'm amused, it, it kind of gets my back up because for about a month now I've had I've had a inquiry in with the Pentagon asking them for an interview with Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick of Arrow. And I want to do a one-on-one. -on -one. I want to do the kind of interview that I did with David Grush. You know, it's only fair to give the Pentagon a right of reply. You know, here's this guy alleging that the Pentagon has presided over a cover-up, a criminal cover-up. He's alleging that people have been murdered. It's not saying that lightly, by the way, that people have been murdered to cover this up. We're talking crimes here, guys. If what David Grush is, said in, is saying is true, it's not just illegal, it's criminal. Get that. I mean, I, I, I just do not understand how any mainstream reporter seeing a guy like David Grush coming to a podium under oath, as he did before the Congress 
not long ago, and testifying under oath to the veracity of what he told me and what he told my friends Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal from, um, I think they wrote it for the debrief. This is momentous stuff. If this is true, if he's lying, he's going to jail. He's lied to Congress. This is one very brave or one very foolish man, and I know which one it is. At no stage has the Pentagon responded specifically to the allegations made by David Grush. David Grush alleged to me, and I'm happy to say he went into much more detail with me in the TV interview than he did in the debrief, he went on the record asserting that there has been a 70 to 80, in fact a 90 year cover up if you go back to 1933 when the Magenta incident occurred in Italy. He's alleging that the US has recovered multiple, he won't say how many because it's a national security secret, but I suspect it's, it's certainly over 10 non-human craft. And more importantly, what people forget, his article, the debrief article, backed it up with an assertion from Colonel Carl Nell, N-E-L-L. Now remember that name, you're going to be hearing a lot more of it. Colonel Carl Nell <laughs> is a guy who knows a lot. The fact that he came out and vouched for the credibility of David Grush as an unimpeachable witness is extremely important. And what has the Pentagon done in response to that? Completely ignored it. There's also, and they used, a, I think they used a pseudonym, Jonathan Gray, the guy from NASIC, which is the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. So he's a serving intelligence official. But knowing how Leslie and Ralph operate, like me, they've probably got a statutory declaration from this guy. He's probably testified under oath that he's asserting the truth of what he said. And this guy has backed also David Grush's claims. Now, since I did the David Grush interview, my life has not been the same. I have just been swamped with people from within the legacy program telling me that they are wanting to know how to testify to Congress. And I have passed on to the, um, the relevant committees in Congress people who are willing to testify about things that they know. Some of it chilling. And I'm really happy, frankly, that it's being investigated and I'm really confident that the people that are dealing with it in the Congress are good people. And I saw somebody, by the way, on Twitter today taking a real swipe at the um, uh, Defence Department Inspector General uh, and, and saying, here's a photograph of the people from the DODIG, you know, you know, let's expose these people who are part of the cover-up. I'm really sorry, I do not agree with that. The DODIG people who went into a skiff just last week with Tim Burchett and other representatives of Congress, they are as constrained by their national security oaths and by the laws relating to security classifications as any official in the US government. And it was utterly naive of those representatives to expect that they could sit down in a secure skiff without having the necessary Title 50 security classification clearances and to be able to then get the briefing that they wanted. It ain't gonna happen, guys. The only people in the Congress who have the clearances to hear this stuff are the Gang of Eight, which is a group of eight people, including the new speaker, uh, Mike Johnson, I think his name is, and um, you know various leaders in the Congress, including, by the way, Chuck Schumer, the House Senate Majority Leader. And, um, these people have the clearances to be read into waived, unacknowledged special access program, the biggest secrets of all. There's SAPs, special access programs, then there's um, uh, unacknowledged special access programs, and then there's WUSAPs, waived, unacknowledged special access programs. And the only people who get to hear about those are people in the Gang of Eight. 
And frankly, that's why I, I urge you all to feel optimism. The fact that a member of the Gang of Eight, Senator Chuck Schumer, has put his name, his credibility, and his stamp on mind-blowing legislation. I mean, I just, I had to read it three or four times before I would believe it. This proposed legislation that's going to go up in the NDAA, the National Defence Authorisation Act, in the next few months, if that passes, I think the world may change because it will make inescapable that Congress will be briefed on the existence, if true, of non-human intelligence and non-human technology. That's the only way this is going to happen. Even when they have the hearing on the 16th of November for the intelligence community, Inspector General Thomas Monheim, I fear that the committee members think that they're going to be able to ask Thomas Monheim, you know, names, dates, locations, times, places. They're not cleared to know that. And frankly, I understand why. Because without wanting to sound like a, a sucker for US national security, if it's true that, I don't know, let's just pick a name. Oh, uh, Northrop Grumman. If it's stay true that Northrop Grumman's got a, oh, maybe a disc or something hidden in a hangar somewhere. If it's true that, oh, maybe, what's another one? Oh, Lockheed Martin. Let's just hypothetically hypothesize. Northrop, Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin. Let's hypothesize that they've got a disc hidden in a shed somewhere. That's the most valuable piece of technology on the planet. And I know, again, it sounds old-fashioned, but it also represents potential weaponry. And I'm not comfortable with that. I hate the idea that it might be used for weaponry because it represents energy systems, propulsion systems that could take us to the stars and do wonderful things with exploration. And that's what the scientists I'm talking to tell me. They're so frustrated that they can't share this information. But the, uh, the, the, the thing that I'm fascinated by is that we are on the very cusp, I suspect, of being able to finally ask that question and get the answers. And it may very well be, I, I urge you to be prepared for the probability that Yes, they may concede that there is a non-human intelligence that's been engaging with this planet for millennia. I suspect that's a very strong likelihood. If that's true, by the way, it may not be. The little guy with the placard, please note. Um, but the, um, the simple fact is I can understand, as uncomfortable as I am about concealing technologies, I can understand why cautious heads may be very worried about what foreign adversaries might try and do. It's in Russia and China's interests. If America has the edge on them with possession of non-human technology, it's in Russia and China's interests to push very, very hard for this information to be made public. And the irony is I'm told that the Russians and the Chinese have recovered technology of their own, anomalous technology, let's leave it at that and that there's a similar battle going on, that when Dave Grush talks about a Cold War battle, what he's talking about is competing adversary nations, competing to develop technologies that could revolutionise this planet. Revolutions in energy and revolutions in propulsion and, sadly, revolutions in weaponry. Because imagine, for example, that you can create a propulsive force, something that can lift a craft, a gigantic mile-wide craft, if such things exist. Imagine if you could deploy that propulsive force against a city or against a population. It represents a weapon just as much as it represents a propulsion system. And so I've actually said to people who've talked to me about this issue, I've said, why don't you, you know, why don't you go and talk to the White House and say, and seriously, I've had these conversations. This is the crazy thing about this crazy bloke in Australia is having conversations with people about whether or not they should disclose non-human intelligence from the White House podium. 
I've actually said, why doesn't Joe Biden take leadership and use this as a defining moment in humanity and to announce, if it's true, if it is really true that the United States does have evidence of a non-human intelligence, what better time than right now to reveal the existence of that, to make our sense of ourselves as humans rather than Australians, Americans, Russians, Chinese, Muslim, Christian, Jew, think of ourselves as humans. Imagine that defining moment, if it's true that we are in the presence of a non-human intelligence on this planet, I think we have a right to, to know that. I don't think necessarily, we, in the same way that we don't know how to make nuclear weapons, or at least I hope you don't, I, I actually got once sent the plans for how to make a nuclear weapon. This is some of the crazy stuff that journalists get sent. I was sent a recipe to how to make sarin nerve gas, and I was also sent literally the schematics for how to make a nuclear weapon. And I was so paranoid, I thought it was a setup by my friends from Defence Intelligence, that I actually went to the, the lawyers at Channel 9 and said, have a look at this, I am destroying it in front of you, it is being ripped up. And they went, what is it, Roscoe? And I went, it's the plans for a nuclear bomb. And they went, oh my God. <laughs> But um, anyway, the, the long and the short of it is, I do think it's very important that we recognise that there are sometimes very, very good reasons for keeping things secret. And I share all of your impatience and everybody out there's impatience that we be told as much as possible very soon. And I think the level of secrecy is utterly unjustified right now. And I would love our political leaders to start showing leadership. And, while we're talking about Australia, it would just be nice for our political and defence and intelligence leadership in Australia to take their head out of the sand and at least start acknowledging, as the American government has done, that there is a reality there. And for that little bloke out there with the placard, yes, we agree. Let's get the evidence and let's investigate it. Thank you. So, so can you tell us your name and what you're doing Ian here? Bryce. And why are you here? I'm here to protest against all the misinformation and false news spread by Mr. Cool Tart. Because I'm a scientist and I believe that you need evidence for these things. And he hasn't produced one shred of evidence, yeah, no okay. physical evidence, only hearsay. Right. Which means he's reporting what other people say. Nothing that is can produce Isn't to, that to his convince job as a anyone. reporter to report what people say? Sorry? Isn't that his job as a Reporter? No, you've now got to have evidence. You need to go to that person and ask them to produce the physical evidence. Otherwise, it's just anecdotes and innuendo. And, and why do you feel so passionate that you come and stand here and do this? I've been battling fake news through the Australian sceptics for 42 years, and I'm going to keep doing, doing it. So that's what <laughs> motivates me. Excellent. Well, it's nice you're here. Can I have a look at this? It's, yes. it's amazing. Where's Ian? Is Ian back? We've invited the man with a stick in. Oh, I asked him to come in. He won't come in? He won't come I, in. I thought he was a scientist. No, I, I had... He, he actually tried to buy no, a seriously, ticket. Seriously, I, mean, I actually really do think we need to take the piss with these people because he's accusing us of not being scientific. How can you inform yourself unless you actually come in and listen to what we're actually saying? Yay! Welcome. Welcome. Is there a spare seat? And, and happy to take Excuse your questions me? as well. Excuse me, lady on the right. Is that a spare seat? Ian, would you like to come and sit here? Over here, over here. Yeah. So at least there's one sane person in this room full of crazy UFO people. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Nice to see you. Welcome, please. You're not, un you're not unwelcome at all. Thank you for coming. OK, so we're interested in healthy debate, but if you do misbehave, you'll be cast out. <laughs> we have here Moira McGee, who's been a researcher in Australia for over 50 years. Is that right, 50 years? Moira is ex-military, a lawyer, a woman, <laughs> female researcher, which we don't see as much profile of 
we see a lot of male researchers on YouTube and that sort of thing. But Moore has been around for a long time and has written how many? It's eight books, is it? Oh, she's on number nine and has diligently and consistently sought after the UFO topic for all this time. So, Moira, hit us with one question. You have to be brief. Right. No. Okay. Ross, you talk about the military secrecy. I'm assuming that probably the Chinese, the Russians and some of our adversaries have also got retrieved craft and are re-engineering. I'm assuming that. Can that that competition and that danger of somebody getting extraterrestrial technology more advanced than ours, does that explain some of the military secrecy and evading questions? Well, that was the point that... I, thanks for that question, Maura. I mean, that was the point I was trying to make at the end of my speech, which is that if this is true, if it is true that the United States is in possession of non-human technology, and we don't know that for sure, but there are over 10 officials now, serving and former, in the military, intelligence and defence community who've made that claim, and I think that should be tested, which is what we're saying. Um, there, there are also allegations that I've received from multiple sources that the Russians and the Chinese are in position of similar technology. And that was the point I was trying to make at the end of my speech, which is that if it's true that there is this technology being recovered, I can understand why, as a national security imperative, the US and certain private aerospace companies might want to protect that edge that they might have, because you don't want your rival foreign adversaries getting access to this technology. And, and let's assume, hypothetically, it is maybe the technology of another foreign nation. Maybe there is some foreign nation that has developed craft with the capacity to do what these craft have been witnessed by US military pilots and sensor systems deployed by the United States beyond any shadow of a doubt doing what's called the five observables. And this is the thing that, no disrespect to my science friend here, but the, um, there are the things called the five observables, hypersonic speeds, instantaneous speeds, the capacity to go from naught to 10,000 kilometers an hour in an instant, uh, transmedium travel, stealth, and positive lift. Those are the five observables. The United States government, not me, the United States government is on record as admitting that this is a reality. Now, I don't care what it is just yet. I do care what it is, of course, eventually. I think it's something that warrants investigation. But in that context, I can also understand how any foreign adversary nation would want to know what the US has got, and I can understand why there would be inevitably secrecy to try and protect it. <laughs> we'll just ignore that, shall we? Um, do you want to get the next question? Next question. Okay. There's a lady here with her hand up to the right, Mike. Thank you. Hi. Uh, you mentioned before that um, there was some things that you wish you had not heard, no, that you didn't know. Can we find out a bit more about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I mean, there really are. I mean, uh, uh, <coughs> what, what, this is one of the vexing issues in journalism is um, you do. You get told stuff that... Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll try and give you a good example. Um, somebody just recently has been sending me awful, awful videos of what happened in Israel. And I, I wish I hadn't seen them. They're Israeli military videos that shouldn't be public. You know, they, they shouldn't be public information. People shouldn't see what happened to young girls and children. And it's ghastly. I wish I, wish I hadn't seen that. Um, there are things that quite rightly are not displayed publicly, more to protect personal privacy and, um, and, and also, frankly, national security. There's a lady in green here. I'd just like to know your opinion on Space Force. On, on what, sorry? Space Force. Space, Space, Force. Force. Space Force. Oh, I think it's a load of bollocks. <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean, I've, I mean, like everybody else, I've watched those mysterious people asserting that they were part of some secret mission to some far-flung corner of the universe. 
And, I mean, ultimately it's their word against... I mean, I, I, I don't... I mean, I, I've watched it and I just laugh. I mean, I, 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 they're claiming they went on a 20-year mission or something, and um, what's his name? Corey Good and other people. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I just watched them, and I'm just giving you my visceral reaction. Um, I, I just think I haven't got time to deal with that. I mean, there's enough evidence to deal with where I don't have to be getting into stuff that... Because, I mean, it's impossible to verify. If somebody's saying they, f they were taken out of their bed in the middle of the night and flown to a far-flung corner of the universe um, <laughs> to fight aliens, I mean, what am I meant to do? How are you meant to investigate that? Even if it's true, how can you investigate it? Um, I hope that answers your question. Ian. I'll, I'll give our friendly sceptic a, a go. Can we get the mic to Ian? Uh, can I, can I can we just have... Oh, OK. Sorry, and I'll come back to you, mate. You'll, you'll yeah. be next. Yeah. We're, we're all waiting for Ian. Um, uh, you recently, in one of your interviews, you discussed the relationship between the, the phenomenon and uh, what happens to us after we die. Um, this is an area of interest for myself, but can, can you elaborate further on that? Because that seems to be a relatively recent thing you've discussed. Sure. I'm fascinated by the fact that there are only two really fascinating mysteries that I'm personally engaged with. One is what happens with us after we die, and the other is, you know, are we alone? Are we alone in the universe? And they're two of the, the biggest mysteries for humanity. And the Drake equation, you know, the Fermi paradox, all of this suggests very strongly that we're not alone in this universe, but the issue is are we being visited by a non-human intelligence on this planet? Now, I'm fascinated by the fact that greater minds than I are asserting that we are being, including people who are speaking to me on off-the-record basis from within the US defence and intelligence community, who I think people would be shocked to see speaking to somebody like myself. And this is the dilemma that I have, is that I'm not... I'm not speaking from some kind of smug knowledge. I'm not trying to lord it over you and say, I know something you don't. The simple fact is that there are people that take you into your competence and tell you these things. Um, and in the course of those conversations, the thing that intrigues me is how often what they say, sir, is that what we think of as a technology with this phenomenon of NHI may not necessarily be a technology per se. Um, for example, I'm fascinated with the idea that along with the five observables, which are the oddities that explain anomalous phenomena, there may be a sixth. And the sixth is expressed in a, a, a document that was used in a briefing to the Deputy Secretary of Defence, the slide nine. And it acknowledged formally in a briefing, a DIA briefing, Defence Intelligence Agency briefing, Thomas Modley, the Deputy Secretary of Defence in the United States, was formally advised in a document that whatever this phenomena is, it has the capacity to manipulate human perception, to remotely interfere with the cognitive interface of humans, to actually physically interfere with technology, for example, um, to actually uh, manipulate the insides of thermonuclear missiles and stop them from, either stop them from uh, going through their sequence of launch, or worse still, as happened in Russia, take them right through to one point before the point of deployment of launch. Um, there are mysteries that cannot be explained, that go beyond the idea that this is just a simple technology. And it's why I think Jacques Vallée, one of the grandfathers of ufology, is right when he says that the least likely explanation for the phenomenon is that this is extraterrestrial, i.e. from another part of our solar system or another part of the universe. Um, I don't know, and I was amused my friend here on the right is asserting that I'm saying that whatever they are, they are interdimensional. I'm not. What I'm saying is that I'm reporting what people have told me and inviting people to comment on it, which is that 
perhaps the more plausible explanation that David Grush ventured to me in his interview. And by the way, this is a senior intelligence official, a former serving intelligence official, who operated at the highest levels, literally walked into the White House with a suitcase handcuffed to his wrist, containing the secrets, the biggest secrets in America. And this guy is the bloke that has gone public saying there is a non-human intelligence engaging with this planet, and moreover, we have recovered non-human technology. And what, we're being told we should just ignore that? We should just go, the guy must be crazy. Oh, but let's have a look at what the Pentagon says. Well, what the Pentagon says is nothing in particular. They haven't actually said anything about David Grush. In fact, they've been conspicuous in their failure to attack David Grush at all. All they've done is they've said that... Um, the particular department entrusted with finding any uh, answering the mystery on UAPs, ARO, inside the Pentagon, has not yet found any credible evidence of extraterrestrial visitation to this planet. Well, firstly, we know that ARO does not have the Title 50 clearance to actually ask for the information that David Grush is in possession of. There are very few officials in the Department of Defence that have these necessarily clearances. So what we're talking about here is a secret that has been kept so secret that only a few people inside the defence and intelligence hierarchy are allowed to know about it. And frankly, if it is extraterrestrial, why is that such a big secret? I, th I suspect that the problem that they're having, and it's only a hunch, I'm speculating here based on what I've been told, is that the reason this is so confronting is because the extraterrestrial explanation doesn't work. And David, in his interview with me, uh, talked about the possibility that it's interdimensional. But I think even from his interview, it's clear that it's speculative. Whatever it is, it's real. Because the Pentagon has admitted it's real. And this is the dilemma for the skeptics. For the first time in human history, a government agency is actually acknowledging this is a real phenomenon displaying anomalous qualities that we cannot explain. That's official. You can go and read the reports in Congress where they're acknowledging that there are indeed UAPs displaying anomalous phenomena that cannot be explained. And so coming to the issue of that nexus between UAPs and consciousness, everybody I'm talking to is saying that there is a link. Nobody can quite define it, and I, I think part of the problem for the Pentagon is that perhaps one of the reasons why it's shy about revealing what it knows is because it doesn't know very much at all, other than it's real, whatever it is, and they're trying to explain it as well, but it's a bit like they're feeling in the dark and not quite understanding whatever it is but everybody talks about it being a consciousness-derived thing. And in fact, there are people that have told me that the technology can only be engaged with using human consciousness. Now, I'm not saying that, I hasten to add. What I'm reporting is what I've been told. Journalists are not beacons of authority. We're only ever as good as we're so our sources. So what we're doing is we're reporting what is being said inside that secret world to people like me. And I freely admit there is every possibility that this may plausibly be explained in the, in the long run as black US technology. Maybe it is some secret program. By golly, I hope it is. Because if it is, it means we're all going to the stars. It means we are an interstellar world. Humanity has the capacity to go to the stars. I mean, it means incredible developments in technology. That's what I'm excited about. But what I, what I think is just insane is this ridiculous thing that's occurring at the moment where people want to shut down intellectual engagement and go, you shouldn't even be thinking about this. It's crazy. Don't go there. I mean, let me just read a pamphlet that a certain person was passing out at the front of the... Uh... <laughs> um, this is why science demands evidence, proper conditions, and repeatability. You have none. Yeah, that's the point. That's the vexing aspect of the phenomenon. That's why none of us are being declaratory about what this is. But what we are doing is we are acknowledging what the US itself 
has acknowledged is a reality. And so when my friend here says that Dick Smith has challenged you over my biased and misleading claims, he really hasn't, Ian, because Dick hasn't actually listened to me. Dick has misunderstood. Dick's a really nice guy, by the way. I love him like a brother. He's a good guy. But he... Um, I'm not saying, for example, as you've quoted here, that psychotronic manipulation is a reality. I'm not saying it. The Pentagon is. It's in a fucking slide that was given to the DIA. So why do we ignore that? That's evidence. <laughs> so let's, no, please, let's give our friend a fair hearing, OK? I'm very happy to, talk, to hear from you. Well, I think it's a brave sceptic will open their mouth now. <laughs> but I'll, I will do my best. Australian sceptics are dedicated to investigating Sorry, things... Sorry, can we just get the question, mate? I don't want a speech. Oh, the question. <laughs> OK. I've personally been investigating this, these for 42 years, including UFOs and aliens. The question. And we have a $100,000 reward. Question. Have you read Jacques Vallée? <laughs> do, you, do you have any evidence that would stand up in addition to your hearsay, conjecture and fantasy in your books and your talks, which would stand up to proper investigation because we have a $100,000 prize available to you when you do? Again, you completely misrepresent what I've said. If you read my book, and I strongly doubt that you have, you would see that all I am doing is reporting what sources are telling me. And that's something I've emphasised. Nobody's being declaratory. Nobody's saying this is what this is. What we're saying is that there is a legitimate mystery there. And look, it worked for science to postulate the way you've postulated for much of the last 60 to 70 years, and I, I respect that. But what has happened since 2017 is there has been a gradual unravelling of a new reality that science, and you don't represent all of science, by the way, there are many scientists in this room. Just as a matter of interest, how many trained scientists are there in this room? Could you put your hands up? So there are people of science who are interested in engaging with this issue. And the reason why they are interested intellectually in engaging with this issue is because they, like I, are as perplexed and bemused by the fact that there is evidence. The US government has formally admitted there is evidence that they cannot explain. We don't know what that is. Contrary to what Dick's saying or you're saying, I'm not saying it's extraterrestrial. In fact, I don't think it's extraterrestrial. Some of it might be, by the way. But I suspect that there is a much more fascinating explanation than extraterrestrial. And David Grush hinted at that in his interview with me. He talked about interdimensionality. Now, I have no idea whether that's true or not. But the interesting thing to me is there are people from within the US, the British, the European nations, other nations that I've engaged with, who are talking with a commonality about a new reality, about a phenomenon that they cannot explain, that has been suppressed in mainstream science, not because science is bad or evil, it's because science does the right thing, it does. It asks for data, it asks for evidence. And the frustrating thing for these scientists is they've got observations, they have witness evidence, they've got pilots, multiple pilots. I've spoken to so many pilots. I actually had a conversation three, four days ago with a pilot off the east coast of America, one of these guys who saw what he says was clearly a solid object manoeuvring next to his jet, and I said, have you gone to the authorities? Have you reported this? Have you, have you gone to your, um, your people and reported it? And he said, do you think I should? I wanted to talk to you first before I, I do. And I said, well, why? I said, of course you should report it. You should provide the data. Did you get pictures of it? It turned out he did. I said, can I see the pictures? And he said, well, no, I'm going to give it to the respective authorities now. And I said, I said, please, can I see the pictures? and he wouldn't give them to me. He's going to go and give them to the right authority. And what, what's interesting is what's stopping him from coming forward with that evidence is the, the stigma and, and the taboo that we've attached to this subject matter. And it's interesting because 
you know, we've, got, we've had so many great debates. I remember once, uh, for a story, I, I, I interviewed the guy who completely went against modern science's belief that ulcers were caused by stress. And he's an Australian, and he, he won a fantastic award for his incredible, brave work, where he basically drank the bacteria that he believed induced um, ulcers and proved his case. Often, to be a good scientist, you have to go against the grain. And the interesting thing is, I've been assailed by scientists, and when I engage with them, because I really do, I love science, we should welcome science, and as much as possible, we should seek data. But the, the reality is, often it's incredibly frustrating to try and get data on this stuff, in part because of the taboo that we've attached to this subject. I had a... Um, a guy contacted me who was an F-35 pilot inside the Australian Air Force. And uh, I'm probably revealing that he's one of, you know, a couple of dozen guys in that conversation. But he wanted me to know that he'd seen anomalous phenomena. And I said to him, will you report this to your bosses? Because they're saying that they've got no evidence. And he said, what do you think? What do you think somebody like me should do when the head of my Air Force is telling a, a, Senate, a parliamentary committee that there is no evidence? He said, I'm getting the message that I shouldn't come forward with that evidence. This is the problem, is that there needs to be a free, open, transparent, unpressurised airing of this evidence, because there are so many people out there who want to provide evidence who feel intimidated about doing so. Next question. Over on that side, um, the uh, guy in the grey T-shirt towards the back, Hey Ross, thanks so much for everything you do. A couple questions that might be a little bit farther on the spectrum. Um, first one. Sorry, can we just confine it to one question? Absolutely, yeah, yes. Thank you. Um, is there anything uh, you would recommend we do to prepare personally as a family of a potential event that may or may not happen towards the end of this uh, next few years? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, the, the, what I think you're referring to is that there have been a number of people, John Ramirez is one, for example, a former CIA officer, who says that there's going to be some kind of an incident. And I and many other people investigating this have been told dates. You know, people have talked about dates. But I don't know anything at all to suggest that there is any kind of alleged inevitable catastrophic event or, you know, people speculate. I, I just for the life of me don't know. I wish I knew. But yes, there are a lot of people who hint darkly that the reason why the US government is pushing this issue is because there is a timetable. And I mean, I find it amazing to me that, that mainstream media in the US to this day is still failing to engage largely with this subject matter when you have the second or third most powerful person in Congress, Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, backing legislation that talks about non-human intelligence and NHI technology. He's on the Gang of Eight, for heaven's sake. He wouldn't be asking these questions and allowing this legislation to be drafted and putting his imprimatur to it unless he'd consulted with the White House first, and I know for a fact that he did, and that's the interesting thing to me, is that there is, to a degree, a degree of official sanction for the level of disclosure that is slowly being slowly, slowly, oh, so painfully slowly, dribbled out at the moment. And I don't know what is driving that timescale. Um, I do know that there is a determined cadre of good people in the intelligence and defence community and in private aerospace who do want this story out. And they are scientists. That's the thing that amuses me here. A lot of them are scientists who are frustrated that they can't share what they know because of excessive compartmentalised security clearances which they think are a throwback to the Cold War. They think that there are energy and propulsion discoveries that the world has a right to know. And by golly, if that's true, bring it on. Um, there's a guy, for example, Sal Pei, Dr. Salvatore Pei. 
and he was allowed to secure a patent for the most extraordinary thing a few years ago for a transmedium craft displaying positive lift propulsion using electromagnetic energy. And what's fascinating to me is the patent office did its job and rejected his patent application and said, you know, in order for the patent to be uh, given, it, it has to be a possible craft. You know, this has, this, you can't just postulate a science fiction craft. And then a guy called Sheehy, who was his boss, who was the head of that Paxtuant research unit in the US Navy, wrote a letter to the patent office asserting that this was not just possible, but a probable breakthrough in electromagnetic technology. Now, I don't know the truth of that. I've spoken to Sal Pei, and Sal's deeply frustrated because he can't talk publicly in detail about his discovery. But he is absolutely convinced that what he's discovered is crucially important for humanity. And he's frustrated that even though there are patents which were verified as possible by his bosses, the public's not allowed to know about it. Now, for the life of me, I do not know why that doesn't arouse the curiosity of the US media or mainstream science. What's happened is the usual ad hominem attacks on Dr. Pei. But I think good science demands that the government be pressured to reveal why it is that his commander was allowed to make an assertion to the patent office that his experimental the theory was not just possible, but probable. What lay behind that? And why is it that we have assertions like that, little clues, little nuggets left along the way that we never quite get an answer to? What it does is it fuels a long, deep-standing suspicion that the United States is concealing something. And they may be doing it for entirely laudable reasons. Gee, I really hope they are. They're an ally of ours. Can you imagine the, you know, what we could do if we can develop interstellar craft with the propulsive technologies that are being described? That would be fantastic. Imagine if we could solve the global warming crisis overnight with energy that can be exact extracted from the, the zero point vacuum. That's why I'm excited about this. And that's why at the heart of all of this is the need for good scientific investigation to see if it's got any basis. Uh, there's a gentleman in pale blue, is it? Stand up, yes. No, you, you, <laughs> yes, you. Um, just a question on the bi biologics. You and David Brush have both said, like, the, the greys are more like drones re in recent interviews. And I'm wondering if you've had any chance to corroborate the biologist leaks on uh, Reddit from a few months ago, where they go into incredible technical detail on, on the greys. There's, like, a guy who worked at Fort Detrick in one of the bio labs, apparently. So that's, that's what... I've, I've tried to get to the truth of that. What you're talking about is there was a very long string published on Reddit from a guy who purported to be at a certain company's laboratory at Fort Detrick. And it turns out there is a laboratory by that company at Fort Detrick, which is interesting. Um, but again, I couldn't verify it because the guy didn't name himself. Uh, and more importantly, if it is true, he was claiming that they were working on biologics, that they were working on non-human intelligence beings that had been recovered. It's a very dramatic allegation, but Fort Detrick is one of the most secure installations in the United States. And believe me, I have tried to verify. But all I can do is I can point you to the fact that David Grush, who is a guy who had more high clearances than even presidents, has said the word NHI biologics. And again, if somebody of his status as a former senior intelligence officer says that he's talking about NHI biologics as being one of the issues that he was told about in the course of his research, wh why not at least attempt to engage with that and take it seriously and ask questions about it? And that's what's happening in Congress right now. Congress does want answers. And the frustrating thing is that um, 
<laughs> as they're now realising, the people who control whether or not you get briefed, whether you get the classification access, the Title 50 access or the Title 10 access that gives you access to certain national security information, are the same people in the same defence uh, agencies that are trying to keep this secret. And so to a large extent, I think there's a real risk that, that we're just going to play a delicate game and this is all going to be kept secret for months and months and months and years and years to come. We may never get the answer. But I do think what's fascinating is they were taken by surprise by David Grush. And in fact, I'm pretty sure they knew they had the debrief article coming, the printed article. And David didn't say as much in the debrief story as he did to me in the interview. And I was really surprised when we sat down with him in Los Angeles and I, I started asking him about things. And I decided just to sort of go a little bit further and see what he said. And I was amazed because he started talking about biologics. He talked about the agreements, which is another line that we, um, we talked about. And I'm fascinated. Why, if, if, if somebody's willing to discuss this, and if there's nothing to it, if he's lying, why has there been such a determined effort to stop David Grush from giving evidence in public? And why, why wasn't he able to be asked some of those harder questions? If, if there really is nothing to this, why are they putting such intense security classifications on his capacity to speak? Why does he even need to get a DOPSA? If he's made all this up, why does he have to go to the Defence Office pre-publication security review to get approval to speak about it if it's not in potential breach of national security for him to discuss these issues? Can't you see there's a, there's a glaring dissonance here between what the public is being led to believe and what I suspect is the reality, which is that David Grush knows a hell of a lot more than he's able to let on publicly, and he does want to talk about it in a secure skiff to people who've got the necessary clearances to hear him. But at the moment, there's this silly little game being played inside the, um, the Defence Department and the intelligence community where they're trying to delay the inevitable. And the great thing about the Schumer legislation, if it passes, and the gentleman up the back there asked me, you know, what can we do? Well, frankly, rather than worrying about imminent catastrophes, what everybody should be doing is pressuring Congress to do the right thing, to establish like a church-style Senate Select Committee inquiry that for the first time in 70, 80 years asks these questions in a public domain. Because if it's all bullshit, if it's all a lie, if it is just nonsense, why are they fighting so hard to stop it from being disclosed? And believe me, boy, they are. Joseph, did you have a question? Um, following, obviously, the, the congressional hearing with David Grush, there was, you know, obviously he said to Congress, hey, I'd be willing to you know, discuss this in a skiff, and obviously that never occurred, and now we've got, obviously, skiffs occurring with the IG. So I guess my question is, has he lost his security access to be able to have that skiff conversation or not? He's always got the... Um, requirements under his security oath because David Grush had security clearances where he was on what's called bigot lists that often only the president and a few other people's names were on and, and this has been lost on people that this guy was so senior this is why it has wrong-footed the Pentagon and a lot of the debunkers and critics because he was so senior that he was cleared to uh, get access to over 2,000 special access programs, many of them waived unacknowledged special access programs. And the, um, the, 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 the difficulty that he's got is he wants to give that evidence, but he's not allowed to unless the people hearing it are the people who are entitled to hear it. And a lot of the people who preside on the Gang of Eight are people who are 
people that are represented by the arms industry, the military industrial complex. Mike Turner from Ohio is one of the members of the Gang of Eight. He's totally compromised by the hundreds of thousands of dollars that he gets from the defence industry. Now, I'm not doubting for a moment that he's a good representative, he's doing his job. But the, the simple fact is that um, what's happening at the moment inside the Congress is the public are under the impression that Congress can ask questions and get answers. It can't. And there's this incredible paradox that has evolved in the United States where they've allowed their national security state to become so independent that it's actually, according to Grush, allegedly operating programs that are not within the oversight or control of the various congressional committees that have been established to have that oversight and control. And it's absolutely fundamental under the US Constitution that the Senate Armed Services Committee, the House Oversight Committee, um, and the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence must know about all programs, no matter how highly classified they are. And the incredible thing is, if what David Grush is saying is true, and it's not him saying this, by the way, it's other people saying it as well, the implications are that Congress has lost control of one of the most expensive things in the government, and also technologies that are potentially mind-blowingly important for the, the whole planet. And um, I'm sorry, I've lost track of exactly what the question was you were asking me, but what was the... Ah, oh, yeah. So, so the point is, is that when he, when he resigned from the Defence Department, you automatically lose your right to get access to further secrets and information. But he still has the security clearance that he had when he was working as a defence, very senior defence intelligence official. And so what they have to do in order for him to give evidence in a skiff, they have to give him the clearance to discuss what he's talking about with the people in the skiff. And then those people in the skiff also have the clearance to be able to hear what he's got to say. And what came out with the Defence Department Inspector General the other day was that dear old Tim Burchett, the um, Tennessee congressman and um, the other Congress people that went in, they didn't have the clearances to hear what David Grush was allowed to say. It's quite interesting though, I think his name's Burleson. One of them came out and talked about how it's quite clear that um, somebody has developed propulsion systems that we cannot explain. I've forgotten the exact language. And then apparently there's been an enormous effort to try and slap him down for saying even that, because you're just not allowed to talk about anything that comes out in the skiff. And this is the issue. There, I actually do think there is a possibility that even when David is cleared to speak about what he knows, and even when his corroborative witnesses, and I know, I know some of them, and I'm really excited that they get the chance to publicly testify, I think there's a really strong probability that these witnesses, all of whom have already secretly testified to Congress and also to the Inspector General, there's a really big chance the public may never get to hear what they say because there's a huge pushback right now, an effort to try and put this all back in a box. They were wrong-footed by David Grush because they didn't know my interview was coming. They knew the debrief was coming, the printed story, but we kept secret the fact that David was doing the TV interview and kept it completely off all open comms. And so he did go a lot further with me and said a lot of things that I think has aroused a lot of people's inquisitive curiosity. And um, it, it's going to be very interesting to see. I strongly doubt that there's ever going to be an opportunity, certainly in the current mood of the Congress, for David to be able to speak openly and publicly about the full extent of what he knows. But certainly, I hope and pray that he will get the opportunity to testify before a skiff. Okay, we are now over time. Do, can we have maybe a brief question? A brief question. Uh, this gentleman over here, put his hand up first with the glasses on his head. Hey, Ross. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us what sort of importance TRW has played in this subject and if you've ever spoken to any former staff members. I, I can't talk about individual companies. I'm sorry. Okay. 
Okay. Yep, understandable. <laughs> yeah. Another one, the lady. I mean, uh, TRW are interesting in the sense that um, uh, if you ever watched The Falcon and the Snowman, uh, you ever watched that? Great movie. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a, a young guy who leaked information which showed, or he made the claim that TRW was involved in CIA activities in Australia to push for the overthrow of Gough Whitlam. And it suggested that the CIA was involved in some way in improperly interfering in the Australian election. And it's an allegation that has never been adequately resolved. Um, Christopher, oh God, what's his name? Falcon and the Snowman, Christopher somebody, I forgot his name. But it's a great story. And the um, TRW was the company that he happened to be working at at the time, which handled all the comms between Australia and Pine Gap. Lady over there. In the Melbourne presentation, we asked how we could help you to get more into news and everything, and you said to write to ABC various places, which was done. Now, how can we help you? Great question. Oh, I mean, uh, look, basically, uh, the most important thing for anybody who's interested in this area is to let your political representatives know you're interested in this subject. It's that simple. I've had this conversation with people in Congress because um, there are senators and congressional representatives who do not believe the American public are interested enough in this to, to put their necks out and publicly make a statement about it. And I'm talking to congressional representatives who are actually intellectually engaged with this subject matter, but they're nervous. They're worried about the stigma and the taboo that's attached to the subject of UAPs. And for them, I mean, there was a political candidate once for the presidency who was destroyed because he admitted he'd seen a UFO. This huge, you saw what happened with Chris Christie the other day, the um, presidential candidate. He got asked a UFO question and his response was to ridicule the question. Um, what's interesting is that people like Vivek Ramaswamy, the um, presidential candidate, have actually said that they do think that this should be investigated. He's shown a, a very pleasant willingness to engage intellectually with the subject matter. That's what you can do. Just the simple fact of actually keeping this in the forefront of public attention, writing letters to your editor. So when somebody takes the piss with the subject of UAPs, ask them why. Why? When, when the US admits it's a reality. This is the difficulty for the debunkers and the trolls now, is that we've moved into a new era. This is a new paradigm. We're beyond the stigma and the taboo. It's a reality. What's needed now is for the public, you guys, to push and say, yeah, I'm interested in this subject matter. I want to know more, and I, I'm not happy. In Australia, our Defence Department is officially saying it's not investigating UAPs, it's not monitoring them, it's not interested, and yet I've got pilots and other personnel telling me they're seeing these things and they're frightened about coming forward. And who can blame them? So the best way you can help is by basically making it clear that this is a subject that interests you. And gosh, if ever there was a, a representation of the fact that this is a subject that interests people, it's the fact that, that we've filled a hall on a beautiful Saturday afternoon when we'll should all be at home working in the garden. <laughs> we've got one last question. I'm sorry, other people. We are going to be kicked out and we're completely over time. James Rigney. Yeah, thanks, Ross. It's a short question, but from what you know, what is 2024 going to look like? A lot hangs on the Schumer Amendment. If the Chuck Schumer Amendment passes Congress, I think 2024 could be paradigm shifting. I know there is a push from certain sections of the intelligence community to get the eminent domain provisions changed in the Schumer Amendment. And for those of you who aren't aware, this is an amendment that would essentially allow, and this is the incredible thing about this, the Senate Majority Leader has proposed and supported legislation that would move for the US government to own, to confiscate non-human technology held by, say, for example, hypothetically, gee, Lockheed Martin. Um, and, and those Lockheed Martin sort of companies are very upset about it. They're really worried. And it's funny, you know, I kind of sympathise with them because the implications of it are actually quite interesting. Why should the US government be able to confiscate technology that 
frankly, it's denied existing for much of the last 60 or 70 years. Um, and if you're a technology company or an aerospace company that spent potentially tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars on trying to back engineer or reverse engineer this technology, isn't it just socialism to allow the US government to come in and steal this technology? So I do think that the Schumer Amendment, James, is probably going to be amended uh, before it goes to law, but I do think it will go to law. In fact, in the last week or so, I've had very strong indications from people in the Congress that it is going to pass. And if that happens, well, what will happen by January, February, is a presidential records review board modelled on the JFK records review board will begin a nine-month analysis of, and it's an incredible task, all UFO records held by the US government, and they will essentially work from a presumption of disclosure. So if there are dark secrets held in the US government, unless there's a very, very good reason, by this time next year, you may very well know it.